Hey guys, Spirit of the Lanchester Laws here. Today, we'll be looking at why in this fight, when I start with just 5 more knights than my opponent, I end up with 14 out of my 20 surviving, with nearly half their combined HP left. You've probably noticed a similar phenomenon happen in your own games at some point, where slightly higher starting numbers resulted in a landslide victory that couldn't be explained by micro or upgrades. I really want to emphasize before I start that even though I'm using Age of Empires gameplay as an illustrative example, the things I'm saying apply to pretty much every strategy game. By no means is this purely an Age of Empires phenomenon, but it's a nice game to model it. In fact, Lanchester originally developed his equations in 1916 to describe warfare at that time. So how can you use math to predict the outcome of a battle? Let's check it out. To start things off, there are actually two different Lanchester laws to look at. And before we get to the big one to explain my example with the knights, let's start with the linear law, also known as Lanchester's law of ancient warfare. This describes the situations in which the strength of your army is directly proportional to how many units you have. The classic example is with a Greek phalanx in a narrow choke point. If your infantry is equally trained as your enemies, but you have a column that's twice as long, it stands to reason you're going to end up with about half your army left. The defining characteristic here is that the larger army isn't able to utilize more of its units than the other at any given point in time. There's a limited surface area for the battle to take place, and the extra units are twiddling their thumbs in the back waiting for their turn. It's sometimes claimed that this describes all melee fighting, but I actually disagree with that, and I'll try to explain why a bit later. There is an interesting second case though, in that it also applies to unaimed fire in an enemy occupied area that's roughly the same size as what your forces are in. If you play a battleship with a 5 to 2 ship lead for example, and fire once per round with each ship you have, you would expect on average to lose 2, since even though you have 3 more ships firing in the first round, your opponent is proportionally more likely to hit one of your ships. Here, the randomness of the firing is really what makes it work with the linear law. In Age of Empires 2 and many other strategy games though, units see their targets and seek out enemy units, rather than keep in a tight phalanx formation. The linear law doesn't explain my 5 extra knights situation, where my numbers advantage seem to grow over time. To figure out what's going on there, we need to move on to the much more famous and interesting square law. It's not a be-all end-all, but it is a very simple way to predict the results of combat with a very particular set of assumptions. The first assumption is that you're dealing with ranged combat. We'll see exactly how it changes for melee units a bit later, but this is commonly given as a requirement. The second assumption is that within your army, your units are homologous, meaning they have similar technology and abilities all around. The formula can pretty easily take into account if your units overall are better trained than the enemies, but it has a hard time if some of your units are better trained than other ones of your units. Another important assumption is that there needs to be sustained combat with the whole armies at once. None of that choke point stuff where only the front row of your army is fighting. The final assumption is that the attacks are continuous and universally distributed across the enemy, which is where we tend to introduce a bit of error when applying this to an RTS game. To get the general idea of how it works, when Lanchester published the equations in 1916, he used an illustrative example of two armies, red and blue, starting with 1,000 men each. Suppose the red army divided their troops into two groups of 500, while the blue army kept theirs together. Lanchester reasoned that if the blue army fought the two red armies one at a time, they would come out victorious and support the axiom of divide and conquer, which when used correctly means you should divide your enemy's forces and conquer them one at a time instead of fighting their full force at once. I won't get too deep into the math, but to quickly derive the equations for those of you that are interested, it starts with the idea that for two armies with equal techs, let's say Aztec and Byzantine skirmishers in Feudal Age, the rate that the Aztecs will be losing units depends on the number of Byzantine units. If we want, we can also include a strength coefficient here, which we'll use as alpha and beta. As you upgrade the strength of the Byzantine units or add more of them, the rate that the Aztecs will lose units increases proportionally. 
We can also make a similar equation to describe the loss of Byzantine units. We can then divide those to get a single equation and rearrange it to get rid of the denominators. Next, you can integrate this, which essentially turns the rate that units are lost into concrete numbers of units. Isolating the constant that emerges from the integration, we find this equation, which critically, because it's equal to a constant, means it's the same both at the start and at the end of the battle, which we can replace with that information. From that, we can finally get isolated equations telling us how many units we'll end with, given the starting numbers, and if we want relative strength of the armies. It's definitely not critical to follow all of that in order to use it, and the main takeaway is just these two final formulas. To apply those back to the red and blue army example proposed by Lanchester, the blue army wins the first battle with 866 men remaining. They then go on to defeat the second army with 707 men left. Despite their equal starting strength on paper, the blue army strategy of keeping their forces concentrated allowed them to lose just under 30% of their army while eliminating the other. Pretty powerful stuff. To take a concrete example, if you start with 10 units and your opponent starts with 5, the linear law would predict 5 of yours would cancel out 5 of theirs, and you'd end with 5 units left. In practice, with even some of the square law assumptions in place, you know you'll do a lot better than that, since your units are doing twice as much damage to begin with, meaning your opponent's strength is falling twice as fast as yours. If we fast forward a few seconds into the fight, we can see their units have started going down first, meaning there are now fewer left on their side to fire at you. Suddenly the 10 to 5 has become 9 to 2, and your 2 to 1 advantage is now over a 4 to 1 advantage. While your side is doing about the same as when you started, theirs are now doing a lot less, illustrating the snowball effect that greater numbers have. The square law in that situation predicts the side with 10 should end with 87% of their HP left. In practice, it doesn't quite end up being that good, since the square law assumes that a unit that is at half health will attack with half strength. In this case, it's not quite squaring the starting units, but it's something more like the power of 1.94. As the number of units increases, that effect should tend toward a squared relationship, but will never quite get there unless you're in a game where a damaged unit has a corresponding reduction in their offensive strength. When it really starts to break down though is on the smallest scales. Lanchester Square Law predicts in a 2 verse 1, the two units will again end with 87% of their HP left. If you think about it though, each of those two units will need to do about half the damage necessary to take out the one unit, meaning in the same amount of time the single unit should likewise be able to do half the damage needed to take out one of the other two, leaving them with 75% of their combined HP left. Again, the discrepancy is because the square law assumes that the damaged unit will be attacking with less strength, whereas that's of course not true in Age of Empires. A better way I found to more accurately predict these small engagements is to slightly modify the formula. The difference is instead of square rooting, you divide by the winning side's original number of units. That way, when you're doubling up against the unit, you get the correct experimental value of 75% HP left, instead of the 87% that the square law would apply. In moderate scale battles like 10 versus 5, you actually get a result that's somewhere in between the two. Now, melee units in Age of Empires are a bit of an odd case. I don't think it's entirely correct when people say they'll follow the linear law, as they fulfill some of the square law assumptions, like the ability to double attack another unit. At the same time, they have to pathfind between targets, which makes them less efficient than archers at moving on to the next one. In testing it with champions, I find the best fit is using an exponent of 1.68. This is reasonably similar to a study published on StarCraft that found 1.56 was the best for their data. I think the least we can agree on is that it's definitely not linear with a power of 1, but also not the full square effect. 1.5 to 1.7 is probably a reasonable estimate, but is really going to depend on the exact case. So far this is all just looking at the total number of otherwise equivalent units though, and the square law can do a lot more than that. To factor in unit strength, it's not quite as easy as just looking at the stats, and it seems to me a more useful measure would be to consider their strength as the inverse of the amount of time it takes to kill an enemy unit. The faster they're able to take down their target, the stronger we'll say they are, and in a way that manages to factor in both sides HP, attack damage, attack rate, and armor all at once. It occurs to me this would have been another way to look at the Paladin versus Cavalier comparison I've analyzed before, 
Using this method to compare their strengths and using the square law gets us that 36 cavaliers and 30 paladins are equivalent, which is pretty close to what we find in testing, assuming you're using the full square relationship and have set up a situation where the units start in a way that they can easily pick a nearby target. So overall, the main takeaway here is that numbers advantages are incredibly important. There's definitely something to be said for raiding all over the map in small groups and overwhelming your opponent by spreading their attention. But when it comes to decisive engagements, a slight numbers lead can be just as significant as a proportional tech advantage. Of course, use some common sense when applying that to a real game situation, as technology upgrades are obviously important as well. Other factors like population efficiency, choke points on the map, attack bonuses, and micro are all going to add their own effects to the outcome of a particular battle. I'm certainly not advocating you should stay in Dark Age and build 100 militia, praying that Lanchester will help you carry the day. So hopefully that'll help you out in your next game, or at least give you a bit deeper insight into something you've probably sensed intuitively at some point. That's all for this one though, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.